conversation and discussion. Thank you all very much for being here at this time. And this weekend, we have had some rather exciting presenters, besides our keynote speaker, Dr. Tonstad. We had Dr. Dillis Brooks. We had Pastor Anthony Turner and Alicia Johnston. Did I leave somebody out? <laughs> Those are our main. And of course, we had, um, coming in from the community, Pastor Daniel Chisto. And we had uh, Patty Prasada Rao. And uh, we had, who else did I leave out? Oh, of course, we had our pastors. We are taking for granted. <laughs> our dear pastor, uh, thank you so much. You're a gift to Sligo, as well as your executive pastor, Pranita Fila. You're a gift to Sligo. We are very proud of you. These are WAU graduates. They were in the department <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> That's all I have to say. My claim to fame is Alex and Pranita. Thank you all very much. God is good. And this weekend, I want to say how um, impressed I am uh, of the level of engagement. And so we hope that this finale will even itself increase as far as the level of engagement. Hopefully, we will have uh, more people get to hear from more people online. So thank you all for being here. We want to begin with prayer before um, I introduce the speaker. Another of our pastors, Pastor Chavez, will pray for us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to be together, to study your word, and to be informed by your Holy Spirit. Please guide us in our conversation and our discussion. May everything we do and say here be honored honor you and bring glory to your name, for we ask in your name. Amen. So, our speaker for this weekend is Dr. Sigvis Tonstad, and Dr. T Sigvis Tonstad, as we've been saying, <laughs> He uh, covers quite a, way, a range of competencies. Um, he's a physician. He is a practicing physician. He is a pastor. And I think he is the cream of the crop of Adventist theology. Uh, of, uh, I shouldn't say Adventist theology. Adventist theologians. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist theologians. There's a difference there. <laughs> uh, Seventh-day Adventist theologians. And I say there's a difference because he not only engages the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he engages the wider theological community outside of Seventh-day Adventism. And I hope that our church is proud of this treasure of Adventism. And I hope that we recognize that treasure before we no longer have it. I thank God for Sigvi. <laughs> So Sigvi is research professor of biblical interpretation, and he's assistant uh, professor of medicine at Loma Linda University. So he wears those two hats at Loma Linda. This is amazing. Sigvi, Tonstad, as I say yesterday, I am so fascinated by the name. And I learned from reading his bio that the name of the village in which he grew up is Tonstad. Okay. <laughs> He completed a BA in theology at Middle Eastern College in Beirut, Lebanon, and Andrews University. His MD from Loma Linda University was in 1979. He completed residency in medicine there. And of course, as you can see, Sigby seems more interested in theology than medicine, but I may be wrong. I know him as a theologian, not as a physician, but I'm sure other know, others know him as a physician as well. And I can't tell you how impressed I am with that. Um, he has written several books, and these are the ones in English. And uh, English, The Scandal of the Bible, 2000, 
Saving God's reputation, the theological function of Pistis Yesu in the cosmic narrative of Revelation, 2006. The lost meaning of the seventh day, uh, 2009. God of sense and traditions of nonsense. You need to get that book. Um, uh, uh, 2016. And of course, letter to the Romans, Paul among the ecologists. 2017, and he's written a Paideia Commentary on Revelation, 2019. And um, of course, he has other controversial, um, I mean, uh, uh, other chapters, uh, book chapters that he has written. <laughs> How did that word come up? <laughs> Forgive me, Sigvi. But Sigvi is not afraid of that term. <laughs> um, he has other chapters that he has written. And um, I have collaborated, I've had the honor of collaborating with Sigvi uh, on a book on, on Sabbath. And as I said last night, if you want to have a well-researched work produced, please give it to Sigvi to review. Because, of course, in his area, he will not leave a stone unturned. Uh, so these are his awards. Of course, his, his brilliance has been recognized. Uh, he uh, received uh, the, the Charles E. Wagner, uh, not Wagner, Wenninger, the Charles E. Wenninger Award for Excellence in 2022. He was named the University Alumnus of the Year at Loma Linda University. He's married to Serena hasso tonstad <laughs> Serena is sitting there who grew up in Baghdad as the daughter of a Swiss mother and an Iraqi father. Quite an exciting life. They were classmates in medical school. Serena has a PhD in lipid research and is nationally and internationally recognized for pioneering work in preventive medicine. They have two daughters, Lynn, who teaches, and Lynn, a rather charismatic theologian um, who teaches theology at Yale University and Christelle, a graduate of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard where she studied public policy and Christelle did internship right here with Roy Branson at our Center for Law and Public Policy. And, um, and so, uh, and, and Christelle works on issues related to refugees and corporate responsibility. So Sigve uh, has raised and nurtured a family along with Serena that are keenly concerned about human well-being, uh, not only uh, physical well-being, but their social well-being and their spiritual well-being. I, 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 I am so honored to encounter this family that has dedicated their lives to the service of humanity. And it's an honor and a privilege to have you as our keynote speaker. And so, without further ado, we will listen to the finale of the very intriguing interpretation of Romans chapter 1 by Dr. Sigvi Tunstead. Well, thank you again for that introduction uh, and uh, for the privilege of being here. I am very honored to, to have been invited here, and, and, um, uh, and I th am happy for the topic, too. This is not the topic I usually talk about. I have <coughs> had some reason to immerse myself in the problem of evil and post-Holocaust reality. That is my, my uh, main thing. But it is not lost on me that this is a crucial topic and that how to read the Bible on this particular topic, that that, uh, that is, uh, is significant. You are live streaming this, uh, these presentations and I had a letter uh, for me uh, coming in from Europe this morning about someone who was uh, deeply affected and uh, wanted to engage, uh, engage more. So, <clears throat> all right, from disgust to humanity, the vile they and the virtuous we in Romans, 
And we are still, <coughs> yes, in this letter, and yes, this presentation is also intended to be textual primarily, although we will branch out a little around to um, a little more on historical context and on on the subject as it progresses in, in our world uh, today. And uh, my uh, commentary on Romans was <coughs> originating in the ecological hermeneutics context at the Society of Biblical Literature. I had presented some papers in that uh, setting and Norman Habel, when he <coughs> wanted our group to uh, write a whole uh, commentary series on the whole Bible, he turned to me and he said, <coughs> I expect you to do Romans. And actually that was something I was happy to do and, 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 and have uh, been very blessed by, by that project. <coughs> so we are doing this at three levels, <coughs> as we have said now a few times. Level one, <coughs> we did it without paying attention to the context even though we learned a few times now that paying attention to con or not paying attention to context is illegitimate you, you simply can't do that with a letter you have to see how it uh, what the context is but that's what we did and <clears throat> we saw that there was a causal cascade in the reasoning of the letter from idolatry to depravity and then we said that in our reality, that cascade is not immediately evident. There are people, human beings, individuals, whose experience does not run from idolatry to depravity. There is no idolatry. And whether orientation should count as depravity, that is certainly, certainly debatable. So we have an issue about how to describe and how to prescribe, as it were, from, from, uh, uh, from the text. <coughs> then we are going now to, to the second level, uh, and we did that in church this morning. It was a mouthful. I had a bad conscience afterwards, and I didn't feel particularly uh, good because it was an ambush. On, it was in some ways a homiletical ambush on... Uh, on, on the church family here, not having been here last night, and actually uh, it takes more of a break in, but <coughs> I count on a sort of aftermath and a, a discourse, a process, and we'll see where, uh, what ends up in the end. So <coughs> what we said at level two is that there is a speaker switching scenario. There is a speaker switching scenario. That is evident in the text. Whether that scenario is clever pedagogy, whether it is Paul who creates what Richard Hayes calls a homiletical sting operation, or whether it is not a clever Paul, but a real situation with some other people, some opponents, <coughs> Uh, what one has called hostile counter-missionaries. We considered those options and we left it open-ended. We just did a descriptive reading about that issue. <coughs> now, <coughs> the, uh, the importance of that question, of course, for Romans as a whole, is not, uh, is not uh, minor. Uh, Douglas Campbell, he suggests about 11 possible reasons why Paul wrote Romans. We are saying that each letter has to have a reason. And when the mail service is as arduous as it is in the first century, you have to have a strong reason. I think I will write a letter today. Well, if you want to write a letter today, you have to say, you have to find a courier to carry the letter. And you have to send that courier from Corinth to Rome. And they have to walk from the southern part of Italy to Rome on their feet, most likely, unless they are extremely wealthy. There was a road, you could go there on chariots or on horses if you were wealthy. 
but your, the threshold for writing a letter in such a situation would be formidable. It isn't email. It isn't even the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, so, so of the possible reasons for writing Romans, uh, you can whittle that down to about four major, major candidate, uh, candidate uh, hypo uh, hypotheses, as it were. And I have uh, <coughs> landed on this one, that the uh, uh, reason to contain ho uh, hostile countermissionaries is the strongest uh, candidate. It is stronger than, uh, I do think there is a mention for, of a Spanish uh, mission in the letter. There, there, there is no doubt about that. And there is mediation between the weak and the strong. In my view, not com reasons compelling enough to send Phoebe from Cancrea in Greece to Rome to do that. You just can't, you know, you, you have to cut your losses. So that's our theory. So <clears throat> when we take that into consideration and weigh the options as to why you have this pushback in Romans too, then it seems to me that the counter-missionary hypothesis is is stronger and that that really makes a lot of sense as we listen more closely to the rhetoric of the passage we are studying. Well, we are now <coughs> at our last presentation and we are reading the text again with attention to tenor, to the tenor of the passage, especially the tenor of disgust. And the terminology here, I'm indebted to some extent to someone I will uh, introduce in a minute. <clears throat> but before we get to that, I want to <clears throat> make uh, a little bit of a perspectival uh, approach here, step back uh, from Romans a moment. And I am going to <clears throat> uh, enlist the help of Peter Brown. Now, Peter Brown, if Peter Brown is not on your curriculum, <coughs> please put him on your uh, to-do list. Uh, or please uh, put him on, uh, what is that, what is it you call it in, uh, uh, bucket list, yes, bucket list. <coughs> so I consider Peter Brown one of the finest historians and church historians around. I think there is not a book Peter Brown has written that isn't worth, worth reading. And I think I have most of them and have read a considerable amount in, uh, uh, of all. His <coughs> biography of Augustine in 1967 is a landmark publication. And I see my colleague here uh, nodding and, uh, and I see others who are also impressed by Peter Brown. He has coined the term late antiquity. That is a, 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 a term attributed to uh, Peter Brown. Late antiquity is the period of early Christianity into the, the century of Islam. So we are in sixth, uh, seventh century thereabouts. <coughs> and I think that term, late antiquity, has in some ways uh, taken hold, even though some people feel that that it, it is not, uh, uh, not uh, you know, there are other ways of describing it. <coughs> Peter Brown is now Professor Emeritus, he's still alive, and he has taught at Princeton for many, many years, and he has trained a whole generation of scholars who are all singing his praises uh, for, what, for his mentorship. So the book we are going to look at will not be Augustine or like I, there are other titles and more titles than I show you here, but we're going to let him give us a di guided tour of late antiquity uh, uh, around the Mediterranean. And uh, so you can imagine we are going on a Mediterranean cruise it will take us about 200 years to complete the cruise. You know, we'll go around uh, uh, the <coughs> core uh, uh, cities here. <coughs> here is the map. And here are the spots we will visit on our cruise, as it were. And it will go, it will take us <coughs> 
200 years. Notice, though, the title of the book, The Body and Society, Men, Women, and Sexual Renunciation in Early Christianity. That is the body and sexuality or sexual renunciation. That is what Peter Brown will, will give us in this book. And he has certainly done his footwork. It is a, a masterful book. I have owned it for some time, and I have read and reread in it <coughs> a number of times. <coughs> so here we are on our Mediterranean tour. We're stopping first in Carthage. We are not going to uh, immerse ourselves with Tertullian, but he is one of the prominent church fathers. You have heard his name. And Carthage, of course, is a city of some note and had been for a long time. And Tertullian is actually quite a, an, a, an, he's not very attractive the way he talks because he's very strident in his, his rhetoric, but he is actually quite fond of the body. He is uh, unusual among the church fathers in his like for, uh, of the body. But he doesn't like women. So indirectly, he's a, he's a male chauvinist in the way he talks about women. And in some ways, for that reason, he is also someone who disparages sexuality. There, you don't get much of that from him. So we, <coughs> we'll just leave him behind and <coughs> jump to... Uh, a person who is hugely influential. Origin of Alexandria is the most influential Christian apologist in the pre-Constantinian era. So the first three, 400, 300 years plus of Christianity, after the time of the apostles, the most influential thinker is Origin of Alexandria. He is a very learned man. He wrote as much as Ellen G. White and, <coughs> and Luther, and his output is prodigious. But unfortunately, some of his uh, books have been lost. Well, I will read a statement from Peter Brown about origin. A high-pitched platonic notion of the soul as an utterly spiritual substance entitled to the immediate vision of God had begun to spread in Christian circles. Heaven was the true fatherland of the soul. The idea that the souls of good Christians did not make their way instantly to heaven struck later Christians as almost a denial of Christianity itself. This is origin. He is the most hardcore anthropological dualist in the history of Christianity, just about. There are many good things to say about him, and I have written a chapter in my book, God of Sense and Traditions of Nonsense, about origin, where you see an other side of him that I think is, unfortunately, has been lost. But this part of origin's legacy is not uh, completely benign, as you can see in the drift of my, my thinking here. Well, <clears throat> we are continuing up the coast, and we're getting into the era, area that has just been hit by a very devastating earthquake. Antioch, this, these cities in the uh, eastern Turkey uh, there, uh, that is known as Cappadocia. And the Cappadocian fathers, there were three of them. And <clears throat> one of them is Gregory of Nyssa. And he liked, he had one favorite topic. He wrote books on virginity. If you really want to do it right, you don't do it at all. <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just embrace virginity. Virginity is what God has had in mind for for humans, and the way he describes it, the way he tries to entice his audience to embrace virginity as the ideal state is quite amazing, and that is the title of one of his uh, of one of his books. <coughs> so I am mentioning him, and then <coughs> I did put uh, Constantinople on our itinerary because the Cappadocian fathers, one of them, did in fact become the leading bishop in Constantinople, and they are similar in their thinking on this. 
Well, we go to Italy. <coughs> we, Serena and I were just there, and, uh, and we go there once in a while, and, and it has been very educational, and I have been to Milan a few times. So after when it became hard to defend the Roman Empire, or defend Rome, the administrative apparatus of the Roman Empire moved from Rome to Milano, to Milan. And at the time when Ambrose is bishop in Milan, the headquarters of the Roman administration is also there. So there is something big going on there. And Ambrose, he preaches in Milano, and he is also extremely fond of virginity. He writes the most amazing things about how the undamaged body of Mary that isn't tainted by sexuality in the way we, con we think about these uh, matters. And here is a, uh, and again, I have spelt out some more of these things in my written version of this uh, presentation, but here is one statement from Peter Brown. In a phrase heavy with late Roman meaning, Mary was an aula pudoris, a royal hall of undamaged chastity. There was, as it were, no trace. There had been a, 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 a body, a child conceived, and a baby born, but you couldn't see it. There was no trace in the body of Mary, and she is, in some ways, untainted by any sort of sexual connotation as we know it. Well, in Ambrose's audience, there is a man sitting there who will be even more influential than Origen. And who is that? Augustine. There is Augustine. He is sitting in the pew, and he listens to Ambrose. And he has been through many phases in his intellectual journey. He is an amazingly gifted young man, and very impressible and very earnest, and there is something very attractive about Augustine. You cannot take that away from him, even though he is, in my view, totally mixed up on this subject. <coughs> so we go to uh, Augustine. Uh, his, he was born in North Africa. He came from a city in the interior there in North Africa. Then he traveled to Italy and had a career as a rhetorician, and then after his baptism and conversion, and he returns to North Africa, and he is a bishop for more than 30 years in Hippo, on the coast of, uh, of North Africa. And <clears throat> Algeria has been, uh, 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 had a civil war for a while now. It is uh, peaceful again, so, uh, at least somewhat. But I went there with my youngest daughter once, and we visited Annaba, that's the name of the town now, it used to be called Hippo, and we went to the church, the Augustinian church in, in Algeria there, and I met the successor of Augustine, the apostolic successor of Augustine, a French uh, uh, clergyman, very nice person, and we had a nice conversation. Here is Augustine on on uh, sexuality. There are two things, because it gets more refined. There is a refinement from Gregory of Nyssa to Ambrose. Ambrose will talk both about Mary and about Christ. Both of them are sort of untainted by sexuality. And here is what Peter Brown says about Augustine, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Mary had not felt the slightest eddy of uncontrolled feeling at the moment when she conceived Christ. The physical sensation of the sexual act had been fully consonant in her case with the untroubled movement of her will. Augustine extrapolates this, the sort of Mary's experience at the conception of Christ. It is amazing that they go into such detail, that it is so anatomical, almost voyeuristic, you know, to see the sort of internal organs of, of, 
of these uh, <coughs> important uh, people. But Augustine will not only describe Mary, he will uh, extrapolate back to Adam and Eve. So there is an Eve aspect too. And Eve and Adam, they have sex as though under anesthesia. You don't feel anything. That is how, it, uh, how he kind of sanitizes it. That is really how these people were thinking. <coughs> well, <coughs> you want to travel around one more time, <laughs> you know, go Mediterranean a second lap. Augustine's contemporary Jerome, and they corresponded with each other. Uh, uh, Jerome was in Bethlehem, and he is a translator of the Vulgate, so he is a very influential person too, and a very austere person, and more severe also than Augustine. This is one statement from Jerome, take up the hatchet and cut the roots of the sterile tree of marriage. <clears throat> you know, get rid of it. The, mar the marriage state is not the ideal. And the notion of one man and one woman is not the ideal either. The ideal here for these Mediterranean church fathers is abstinence, it's virginity. It is in some ways to repudiate the body and sexuality that goes along with it. <clears throat> so the rhetoric they use is so, is so uh, it's colorizing it. There is a kind of color to it. And uh, and uh, in many uh, cases, it is outright disgust. What is disgusting here is sex, heterosexual sex too, not just sex of other uh, types. There is a cloud settling on body, repudiation of the body and repudiation of sexuality. That is what we get on this 200-year journey, and it continues today because we still have a Virgin Mary who is a perpetual virgin. She is undamaged by any sort of uh, sexual uh, uh, traces or traces of the birth canal being affected by the child that she gave birth to. <coughs> I'll say one more thing about Origen because he is so influential. <coughs> so I'll read this uh, statement from Peter Brown. Origen bequeathed to his successors a view of the human person that continued to inspire, to fasc fascinate, and to dismay all later generations. He conveyed, above all, a profound sense of the fluidity of the body. Basic aspects of human beings, such as sexuality, sexual differences, and other seemingly indestructible attributes of the person associated with the physical body, struck origin as no more than provisional. The present human body reflected the needs of a single, somewhat cramped moment in the spirit's progress back to a former limitless identity. That is to say, no body. Soul that is immaterial, that is immortal, that is the ideal. That's what you used to be as a human being. And that is the state to which you will return. And everything here that is physical material is transitory. It is kind of a temporary descent into a reality that we long to be delivered from, as it were. And <clears throat> then I want to share this one with you as well. Now, I could have read Peter Brown on Augustine, and it is certainly worth doing that, and I cannot recommend his work on Augustine too highly. But this is James O'Donnell. Uh, Augustine wrote on Genesis over and over. He never stopped writing about Genesis and Adam and Eve. And yes, it is in some ways a little voyeuristic what he does with these texts. <coughs> but 
Here is how James O'Donnell hears him. And when I read this the first time I read it, I thought, wow, you know, that is really, really insightful. Because, yeah, let me read it first and then make a comment or two. This is how he hears Augustine in Confessions and in Augustine's work on Genesis. This is what James O'Donnell hears. Very often the most ferocious assertions we encounter are the ones that seem to have the least basis in fact because they are the ones that have the greatest basis in fear. Now think of that sentence for a moment. People hold strong opinions and you live in a very polarized country now. And there are strong, strong opinions on, on one side, certainly. And some of those opinions may not have much basis in fact. They may have some basis in fear, perhaps. Anyway, that is what you are kind of, what he is letting us sample here. So you have in Augustine assertion after assertion that are not so much true as necessary, that are not so much what Augustine knows to be the case, as they are what he has to say in order not to face what might be otherwise. The virginity of Mary, the undamaged body of Christ, the untainted this, the untainted that. And Augustine committed and credibly committed credibly committed to celibacy, to loneliness, all these years, and in some ways engaging in an exercise of self-persuasion, not only persuading you, but trying to make himself believe in something that isn't so. This, I think, is a, is a spectacular insight, a spectacular observation about Augustine. <coughs> so, what, is the, what are we seeing here? And this is completely different, or at least not the way Adventists tend to talk about the early Christianity. The usual uh, thing, and now I am... I am impeded by the microphone here because <laughs> I would like to walk and, and uh, you know, gesticulate or whatever here. The usual narrative is that the history of Christianity, there is a deterioration because Christians become worldly. But that isn't the whole story. It is actually the opposite in many ways. Christianity becomes otherworldly. It is the extreme otherworldliness of early Christianity that impresses us here. And here is another one who thinks somewhat like Peter Brown. I, am, uh, I know that they, they were aware of each other's work, and I'm sure they, interact, they have interacted. So Robert Marcus, who descended from uh, Jew, assimilated Jews from Hungary and was a church historian in, in, in Britain. He talks about this period as an ascetic, ascetic invasion, asceticism, repudiation of the world, repudiation of the body. You move out into the wilderness like Antony did in Egypt. Antony, whose biography made Augustine weep in Milano and become a believer. Anthony, a hundred years earlier. Uh, monasticism. Monasticism in Syria, too, where you withdraw to the desert. There was an ascetic invasion. And then he uses a term, epistemological excision. And I have an illustration for that. <coughs> this is what an excision looks like. <coughs> And I have had an excision like that on my back because I had a, pigment, a pigmented lesion on my back that my wife uh, saw. She saw it early. And I have met one of an oncologist in the audience. I had a very early detected malignant melanoma on my back and it was <coughs> uh, very uh, successfully uh, excised. But the 
epistemological excision Robert Marcus talks about is not the excision of a malignant nevus on your back. It is the whole world. It is the material world. It is the body as such. It is huge. It is a repudiation of materiality, physicality, the body, and yes, sexuality. It's not worldly. It is otherworldliness that is the problem. That is uh, not the way we usually tell this story. And now, I am quite <coughs> proud of my daughter who has written uh, interesting things on the subject. The way she summarizes, the way she makes a statement about uh, Adventist anthropo or uh, anthropology, biblical anthropology, uh, you might say, uh, just, I think she says it extremely well. Yes, this is one area that she and I agree with 100%. 100%. This is how she, she describes it. Instead of recognizing the identity of the self with the body and the mind with the brain, philosophers and theologians, we have mentioned some, have imagined that there is something else that carries the identity of the human being. A rational mind irreducible to the brain or a soul. Uh, the human person is imagined as divided between two different principles, with one of them, the soul, of more value and lastingness than the other, the body. The two are often thought to be in conflict. The body's unruly desires need to be subdued by the rational mind. Now, <coughs> this is a, a statement on the dualist, the dualist anthropology that is also one of the core tenets of Adventist belief. Adventists are not anthropological dualists. That is what we are hearing here, or saying there is a critique of that dualism here. Well, let's get it from someone else uh, too. This is Daniel Boyarin. <coughs> Daniel Boyarin is a professor at uh, UC Berkeley. He is probably the most interesting and most influential Jewish theologian in America today, and a public intellectual too, who has opinions about many, many things. And I have been in the same room with him uh, on some occasions, and usually the audience is electric, because he is a very fascinating and uh, communicator. <coughs> and this is what he says <coughs> in, on a book, in a book, called Carnal Israel. Recent gender theory has provided us with extraordinarily subtle analyses of the ways the mind-body split is inextricably bound up with the Western discourse of gender. The critique of dualism is in fact at the heart of the founding text of modern feminist theory, Simone de Beauvoir's the second sex. I have to digress just a little here and I'll show you a couple of pictures and then we'll make a comment on it. Uh, so so uh, he uh, is ref referencing Simone de Beauvoir, who was a partner with Jean-Paul Sartre in France, and many of you know this history much better than I do. Here she is, she is very influential. And in my youth, I had a, I had a friend uh, whose book I have also referenced here, and here is my friend. <coughs> she was my classmate in junior high. We were close friends. She is now a James B. Duke professor at Duke University, and she has <coughs> she read Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, when she was in high school, and it changed her career. It made her totally see that's what I want to be. I want to be an intellectual woman like Simone de Beauvoir. Well, I was not surprised that she became that. She did. But I thought, <laughs> well, I'm not going to read Simone de Beauvoir. I'm not going to go there. That is too secular for me. You know, these people are existentially secular. So I waited. Now I have read that book. And guess what? You know, here I am as a Seventh-day Adventist, and I was away from my house for a few hours, or I was gone for the weekend. And when I came back to my house, there was someone in the kitchen. 
And I came into the kitchen and saw that someone, and I said to that person, what are you doing? This is my house. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I believe in anthropological monism, uh, you know, in the visibility of body and so. And that person was Simone de Beauvoir, or Torin Moy, or Daniel Boyarin, who are as critical of dualist anthropology as any Adventist would ever be. And they told me when I came back to my ho house, this is my house. This is my kitchen. And I went into the bedroom, and there they were in my bedroom too. <laughs> you know, this is, and I said, what are you doing in my bedroom? You see what I'm saying? These secular voices claim as their anthropological home turf what Adventists claim as theirs. And this is still unrecognized in our, in our community. This is simply not, not uh, uh, seen. <coughs> so <coughs> we need to hurry up here because I want to get back a little to Romans before we we finish, but <clears throat> just a couple of items on retrieving perspective, then and now. On a term I saw in a book I read, and I haven't read widely in these topics, but I felt I had to read a little uh, in preparation for this and something else I was doing. The ancient world, both Greek and Roman, did not base its classification on gender but on a completely different axis, that of active versus passive. And that's the, uh, that in, in terms of sexual relations, that applies whether you are hetero or same sex. The hetero relationship is also conceived as a relationship between active and passive, dominant and, and uh, submissive, as it were. That's one uh, retrieval of perspective. And then, <coughs> by another author in the same book. Thus, even as there are no homosexuals, so the Roman sources know nothing of lesbians in our sense. These are different landscapes. They are not, comp not uh, uh, overlapping or you know, translate into exactly the same thing. And the author here, he says, did the concept classification category homosexual as we construct it exist? Here, as I hope I have shown, the answer is simply no. The search for gays in antiquity is pointless. So that is something we have to take with us then as we consider uh, you know, retrieving perspectives. <coughs> but on the anthropological horizon, what these people who do queer theology, feminist, they are anthropological monists. They think that they take bodily experience more seriously than what is normally done in, Christian, uh, in the Christian tradition. So one more person that I don't admire quite as much as I admire Peter Brown, but I have learned many things, and I'm sure she is a person on, on the curriculum of uh, some of you who, who have uh, <coughs> listened to these people. So Martha Nussbaum is a professor at the University of Chicago in the law school and in the philosophy department. And I know people who know her and have had her as a teacher. And I have read some books by her, and I read this book uh, from Disgust, to humanity, that, that was why I put that in our title, uh, Sexual Orientation and Constitutional Law. This is on the legal issue. So this is what she says, just conceptualizing. <clears throat> we need here to think again about the politics of disgust, the way in which homosexuals were routinely portrayed as somehow not fully human, as something like the cockroach, that crawls onto, onto your kitchen floor. That is how she observes the rhetoric. She has dug into the legal cases. She has seen how cases were argued in court, how homosexuals and homosexual activity has been characterized. And it is pretty, pretty uh, hefty, as it were. I will skip this one <coughs> because we need to get to Romans. 
And just to have that concept with us, because now we are going to listen to Romans one last time. So we read here, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. And if I had not been a timid Norwegian, I should have said this much better. If I had been a, 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 a good public speaker in America, I would have given this to you in a much more uh, forceful way. And even reptiles. And the word in Greek is poisonous snakes. You can use it that way too, to see how the person speaking is using the language of disgust. You can hear that, can you, can you sense that? That this is disgusting. How disgusting is that? And we read on. Their women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own person the due penalty for their error. And it is disgusting. That is what the tenor is here. Just like the objects of worship are disgusting, so is the moral uh, behavior. Now we have said that the sexual landscape of that time is not easily translatable or transferable to what we are talking about in our time. You need to keep that in mind. But still, there is a kind of tenor or rhetoric of disgust here. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. Their gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, and here is the way it looks in Greek. Look at it here. I have transliterated it here in this. Uh, so you can see all the words here begin with an A. It means that the quality that is described there is lacking. It is the absence of that quality. And this is why, because it's done so well, why we are saying this is not an ad hoc competition, uh, composition. This is a stump speech. This is something that has been said more than once. It comes easily, it flows. Uh, so it is a, almost like a dictionary of vice, and it is disgusting. You know, that is kind of what the tenor is here. He's using that, he wants you to feel something. Uh, when uh, that goes. And there is one more, one more uh, thing here, the third person, the use of the third person pronouns, they, 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 they. Well, how many are there? Ten of them, as it were. And again, it is derogatory. And again, it is like someone is beating the drum, hitting it hard wanting you to get into the flow of it too, as it were, the marching here. And again, a kind of tenor of disgust. Distance. We are over here. And they, they are over there. They are something else, as it were. So, let's... <coughs> try to see if we can take this home to our side, because the language of disgust here in these texts, I think, needs to be examined. And also the scenario that we tried this morning in church and made life hard for the pastors, uh, uh, the scenario of speaker switching, the scenario of possible counter-missionaries, that we hear someone else's voice there, that there is in some ways, it's not a descriptive precision that strikes us with those terms. It is really the exaggeration, the way you represent reality in a somewhat uh, one-sided way. <coughs> well, 
we will go back a little to our time. Here is Martha Nussbaum. And I think she is uh, commenting here on the case of loving versus the state of Virginia in 1967. If people felt disgusted and contaminated by the thought that a black person had drunk from the same public drinking fountain or gone swimming in the same public swimming pool or used the same toilet or the same pla plates or glasses, all widely held Southern views, we can see that the thought of sex and marriage between black and white would have carried powerful freight of revulsion. Someone, a sheriff, barged into the bedroom of Richard and Mildred Loving in the late 50s and found them in the same bed and arrested them. And they had to move from the state. They moved to Washington, D.C. And then they did go back, and the case was heard by the Supreme Court in 1967 and was unanimously decided that you could have interracial marriage in America. That was okay. It is late. It is 1967. And the arguments against them, the arguments and sentiments against it were the sentiments of disgust. That's the, the sort of conceptual territory we have here. And <coughs> so, she says the same then about same-sex relations. She sees a continuum here where disgust is the common denominator. Beyond moral disapprobation, gay persons also face virulent homophobia that rests on nothing else than feelings of revulsion against, uh, toward gay persons and the intimate sexual contact with which they are associated. Let me try to land this now by going back to Romans. This is the final uh, textual thing I misspoke a minute ago. So here we have it again in Romans. Their women exchange natural, physicos, intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also the men giving up natural, physicos, intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own person the due penalty for their error. It may be that we too, or I too, will say that a sexual relationship between a dominant person and a submissive, you know, an inequality of status is not a very good thing. I might even say that is disgusting, you know, <coughs> that is possible. But it is the terminology here of natural versus unnatural that we want to, to examine. The possibility that something that is called nature is actually culture. It just sails under another name. Here is 1 Corinthians. And does not nature, physis, itself teach you that it is a disgrace for a man to have long hair? But, that is a woman, but it is a woman's glory to have long hair, for her hair was given her for a covering. Well, let me see what nature te teaches you people here. I'm looking at the women. I see some, some people in violation of nature, in grave violation of nature, I have to say. So... Let's look at the comments here. Here is Jewett. He recognizes that appeals to nature are fraught. They could actually be something else. In Paul's usage, there is no awareness of the weaknesses in the Greco-Roman concept of nature, which is culturally subjective and tends to threaten human freedom in that one is supposed to conform to whatever nature as defined by that cultural group demands. On the racial issue, it was nature. It was nature. That is in the nature of things. In issues of sexuality, it is also nature, even though nature in its complexity 
not only in its biological diversity, but not only in its anatomic diversity, but in its biological complexity. That is what we're talking about. That is also nature. Here is Hans Konzelmann commenting on, uh, on 1 Corinthians. The conclusion is that a woman must cover her head. This demand is compelling <coughs> since it is not merely a question of custom, but of the order of creation. Uh, well, we caught him there. We caught him making an argument from culture as though it is an argument from nature. And maybe that can apply to some extent even to the text in Romans. <coughs> <coughs> so <coughs> there was an interview with Mildred Loving <coughs> at the end of, uh, toward the end of her life. She died in 2008. And she gave this interview to the Atlantic in 2007. They did move back to Virginia. They liked it there in rural setting in Virginia. And then eight years after they had moved back, Richard Loving was killed in a drunk, driver, a drunk driving accident. It's very sad. And then she looks back on that story. And she says, <coughs> my generation was bitterly divided over something that should have been so clear and right. The majority believed that it was God's plan to keep people apart and that government should discriminate against people in love. Surrounded as I am now by wonderful children and grandchildren, not a day goes by that I don't think of Richard and our love, our right to marry, and how much it meant to me to have that freedom to marry the person precious to me, even if others thought that it was the wrong kind of person for me to marry. I believe all Americans, no matter their race, no matter their sex, no matter their sexual orientation, should have the same freedom to marry. That's Mildred Loving. I'm still not a political person, but I'm proud that Richards and my name is on a court case. That can help reinforce the love, the commitment, the fairness, and the family that so many people, black or white, young or old, gay or straight, seek in life. I support the freedom to marry for all. That's what loving and loving are all about. I am somewhat awed by that. I think someone who speaks from that setting, that experience, has standing, has it some authority in terms of our, our uh, subject here. <coughs> so here is a bridge. I don't know what will happen in our communities. <coughs> I am not extremely optimistic, and I'm not here to advocate one way or another. That is part of our contract, too. And this is not a topic of my expertise, necessarily. But there is a reality of disgust, and there is a tendency to find some things disgusting that are disgusting for reasons of culture rather than reasons of nature. Those things, we have had to change our mind more than once on those things. Can I do one last example? Jonathan Safran Foer, who is a good, wonderful writer in America, who has written a book called Eating Animals. He says, <coughs> you know, so let me say, I am serving you a meal, and I am serving you chicken. And you say, thank you, I love chicken. That is, you know, that is, you do that. Don't you love chicken? Uh, I actually do love chickens. That's why I don't eat them. <laughs> but, but, but that is another matter. So I am having you as my guest, and I say, I, am, I think you are such a special person. So today I killed my dog, and I'm serving you my dog. 
you know, that's my dog. You are not getting chicken today. You are getting my dog served on your plate. Now, what do you say to that? You say, that's disgusting. I don't eat dogs. Some people do. In some cultures, they do. It's just a, a delicacy. There is not that much <coughs> difference, maybe c killing your chicken than killing your dog and eating it. Be that as it may. It is an example of cultural conditioning, cultural conditioning of conceptions of disgust and what is disgusting. <coughs> so, a journey from disgust to humanity, we've had to make that journey many times, <coughs> and sometimes against Christian traditions in <coughs> many important and big ways. And, <coughs> and uh, I hope, uh, and some ways <coughs> that uh, <coughs> we could make progress on these journeys. I'm sorry for keeping you so long. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Tonstad. Now we will enter into uh, the responses. Could you come up, Paul Anthony, Alicia, and Alex, Pastor Alex? Um, oh, yes, and then after that. Uh, can we have the entire panel? Uh, let's see. Entire panel for this evening. Very interesting presentation. Disgust versus humanity. Thank you for taking us down that journey. Quite a walk. Thank you very much. So we'll have three responses. We'll first have Alicia Johnston, then we will have Paul Anthony, and then Alex Barrientos. So you can begin the conversation. We hope to open this out. I promise you online that we will take your questions, more of your questions, um, this evening. Another, one thing I'd like to ask, when you ask a question, please do not go over a minute in asking the question. We, we really need to have as many people asking their questions, so do not give us uh, a little essay with your questions. <laughs> Just ask the questions. All right, here we go. Uh, I just enjoyed that immensely, so much. Um, you know, I'm just starting to begin to grasp some of the history of um, what the church has taught about sexuality in the medieval period. Um, I find Augustine very interesting. In so many ways, actually, in our sexuality, um, and the way we think about sexuality in general in the Christian church, we're, uh, we're still living out the things that Augustine said, and we're still responding to the things that Augustine said. Um, and then so I just, almost just to underline what you said, um, I, I mean, I really have nothing to add. It was just fantastic. So I, I feel that um, I wanted to draw that line a little bit more clearly between what the church has taught historically about sex and what we are dealing with today. Because you can't erase millennia of teachings overnight. And... Um, you know, what, what Augustine was getting at with, um, from my understanding, um, is that for Augustine, all sex was sinful because it was pleasurable. And for much, much of Christian history, the vast majority of Christian history, 
this has been the case. The sin was in the pleasure. So rather than sin being defined by those things that are um, contrary to love, as Jesus taught, sin was defined as those things that are pleasurable. And you can see the problem in that, can't you? Um, in fact, if you think about it, you can also see why those in power might have a vested interest in defining sin in a way like that. Because if I define sin in terms of pleasure, rather in terms of harm that I cause to other people, I've done several things in one step. I've kept you from standing up for the lives of others that you see suffering, and I've kept you from standing up to the suffering you are experiencing at the hands of these mixed religious and political powers that are telling you what you can and can't do. And I've also just really sapped your energy away. Um, there is an essay by Audre Lorde about um, the power and the energy of our sexuality. Audre Lorde is a lesbian womanist uh, social justice activist. Um, and she writes about how there is power in the erotic. Someone asked, this is really going to make the online audience excited. Um, <laughs> someone, someone asked this afternoon, like, what does, what does the queer community have to give to the church? If we truly believe that sexuality and the erotic is a gift of God, not a sin, because it's pleasurable, but a gift that God has given us because of the love that God has for us, then we see that there is power in the erotic, in the intensity of human connection and love and care that goes much deeper than the sex act, but shouldn't actually be separated from the sex act. Now, this is something I'm just beginning to grasp the edges of myself as I have worked through the shame that, I have been, that has been placed on my body, especially as a queer person. And, and this kind of sexual shame has been used as a tool against all kinds of bodies. Um, if you read, read uh, Kelly Brown Douglas's book, Sexuality in the Black Church, you will read about the ways that sexuality has been used to oppress black bodies in America. So this is, this is, this is a long tradition in Christianity a long tradition that goes back to very shortly after the time of Paul, that most likely has its origins in some late Stoic physicians, not in Judaism, that's for sure. <laughs> and I would argue not even in the writings of Paul, the New Testament. So when we talk about disgust to humanity, I want to put it in that bigger context of what we're talking about, of how that disgust has been weaponized and how that disgust has been used to steal the joy and the energy of people who live lives full of passion, full of love for their communities, full of love for one another, who love their bodies. I mean, this is one of the things about the sex act is it teaches us to embody our souls. It teaches us the connectedness of our souls and our bodies and another human being. Um, one thing you can find, actually, interestingly, in the queer community, um, so many people having been shut out of traditional religious spaces see in sexuality, see in sex itself, a sacred act of deep love and care for one another. And this is something that the Christian tradition tried to completely obliterate historically by making pleasure itself a sin. And Augustine was someone who had a complicated relationship with sex himself. He was somebody, oh, am I running out of time? Okay, okay. Augustine was someone who had a complicated relationship. How much time do I have? One more minute, okay. Augustine was someone who had a complicated relationship with sex himself. This was a man who experienced deep shame. This is not a man who was a virgin. This is a man who, when he converted to Christianity, decided that the woman who had followed him all his life wasn't good enough to marry, and that he would send her off without her child 
and that he would keep her child because her social class was too low for him to marry. And this is a man who wrote vague stories about all the horrible sexual things he had done in his life. And don't we wish we had details? Because we don't even know what he was talking about. But we know that he experienced deep personal shame in his life around sex. And that is not a burden that we, as a Christian church, need to carry any longer. And I think we can reject those things and embrace this exact full embodiment um, that we've been learning about today. Thank you, Alicia. Okay. Alicia. <clears throat> well, I, I, I resonate with what you're saying. <clears throat> now, there is a subtlety to Augustine, so one must make sure that when we critique him, we do not lose our uh, regard for him, our admiration for him. He is a, a very ma a man in, in, in earnest, and to produce and do all the stuff he did is just, is just uh, awesome in many ways. But <clears throat> he does have a conflicted view of, of sexuality. He wishes he had never had sex. At least that's what he makes you think. He, he talks that way. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there is a text in Genesis <clears throat> in... Um, the story of Abraham and, and uh, Sarah, when <clears throat> just to do the blessing part of the, and the uh, God-givenness of it. So, so the word reaches Sarah that she's going to have a child. She's going to get pregnant, and she's way postpartum. And then she says, should I feel pleasure again? Should I feel desire again? Should I... And she uses a word, the word in Hebrew is Edna. It is an echo of the word Eden. Should I go back to paradise mm -hmm. one more time? Mm -hmm. You know, paradise lost, not as Augustine, where sex is a kind of memory of how you lost paradise. But in Sarah's rendition in Genesis, <laughs> what it was like in paradise. You know, that is a very, uh, an affirming thing of, of, uh, of the gift of sexuality. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Tonsat, for your presentation. Um, because of our Adventist upbringings, we kind of go early Christian church, Protestant Reformation, right? And there's a whole lot of history in between there that we don't know about. And I'm sorely lacking when it comes to the church fathers, unfortunately. But, you know, some of these, um, some of the points that you brought out about Origen and Ambrose are really helpful in understanding um, why many Christians um, and unfortunately many Adventists think negatively about the body. You know, it's talking about Origen's hardcore anthropological dualism and Ambrose's um, uh, celebration of Mary's so um, supposed unblemished chastity and body, um, which leads to this notion, this concept that we should repudiate the body. We should be unconcerned with the body. Um, we should not desire our body. We should have a disgust um, for our bodies and anything that has to pertain to it. Um, now, I, when I was at seminary, I got to take a history of philosophy. By the way, thank you for talking about philosophy. I was like, oh, thank God I have something to talk about. <laughs> um, and when I took a history of philosophy class at, at, at seminary, and Dr. Ante Yaranch, we were, we were talking, I don't remember what exactly we were talking about, but he had this moment of clarity, and he, has, he had this really profound quote, and I wish I had written it down, but he said something to the effect of, Adventism is the repudiation or is the calling out of Platonic Christianity, a Christianity that removes us from the world, removes us from our bodies, and supposedly gets us in contact with that which is eternal and universal, um, while and the, and the world becomes unnecessary. We don't need to deal with it any longer. However, this runs contrary to our Adventist um, anthropology. Adventist anthropology is a radical return to the body radical return to the body. And it's really unfortunate that, um, Alicia made this joke earlier, that 
Um, often straight people um, will attack queer people's sexuality and queer people's usages of our bodies because they are ashamed of their own bodies. Straight people are ashamed of their own bodies. So I think Adventism, if we're going to take our anthropology seriously, the return to the body and not to a dualism, to, to an embodied existence instead of a, um, some kind of an ensoulment, um, it's going to require that we really take, we start to rethink maybe how we talk about queer people's sexuality. Are, is the way that we talk about queer people's sexuality um, no different than the platonic Christianity that we're supposedly against? That's one matter I wanted, to, I wanted to express appreciation for. The second thing that you brought up um, was a discussion about singleness um, and the virtuousness of being celibate. Um, when, I was, when I was growing up, when all, all queer people are growing up, it is when it comes to queer people's sexuality, gay and, and, and lesbian and bisexual people's sexualities, all of a sudden the church switches to celebrating celibacy or, or promoting celibacy, when in every other day of the week, the church has, you need to get married, it's right, it's not good for a man or a woman to be alone. Well, we don't wanna be alone either, we got needs. <laughs> My God. Um, singleness, it's interesting how Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter seven that celibacy and marriage are callings from God. Technically, if we're, if we're gonna actually follow, follow Paul's, um, Paul's celebration of celibacy correctly, we should, it, celibacy, is, celibacy is the thing that is, it's a gift given to us by God. It is not a thing that is bestowed upon us by necessity. It is not a thing that we should say, hey, you're gay, therefore you have the gift of celibacy. It's putting the cart before the horse. God gives the gifts, but we have made the, our, preset notions about what queer, the implications of queer sexuality, we have made that, we have used that as a constraint on whom God must give the gift of celibacy to. And that's problematic. Um, thirdly, um, I, I wanna touch on just how important it is that we recognize that whatever the ancient world had in the way of same-sex sexual relations, it is a far cry from anything that we experience today in the 21st century. Um, importantly, um, as I learned from Alicia and then Dr. Tonstadt reiterated today, um, by the way, get Alicia's book. She talks about this a lot. Um, as I understand it, the, the Roman way of going about, about sexual relations was in terms of act, active and passive. That is not how we queer people think about our sexual relations today. So we have to recognize that there is a difference between same-sex sexual relations back in the ancient world and homosexuality or bisexuality as such today. There is a difference there. And so whenever we look at those translations of the Bible that say um, some of you used to be homosexual, it's, a it's, not a, it's not a correct translation. What we are indicating when we use the term homosexual refers to something that is completely different in kind to whatever the Greek term was that Paul employed to talk about what he was talking about. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, I was really, really glad you brought this up, about the natural kinds versus, um, well, about um, how often we, we, we have a disgust about things that seem unnatural, things that seem to be contrary to nature, but is really just contrary to our society, the way that we have been culturally brought up to, to, to think, this is the right way you should go about getting married. This is the right way for you to um, sexually express yourself. This is the right way for you to think about yourself as a gendered individual. And I want to really emphasize and drive home just how much a lot of the ways that we think about what is natural and unnatural has nothing to do about something that is inherent in nature, objectively present in nature, but is really just a product of our culture. So those are just four of the different takeaways I took away from your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. John said. Well, thank you, and I, <clears throat> I just feel uh, very privileged to have shared this uh, time with you and, and, and you. It's, a, it's amazing. So I, I take it I cannot get you to come to our 
bar barbecue this evening when we are barbecuing my dog. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> so I think the people who do <coughs> queer theology and feminist theology, they think that Adventist anthropology is a good start. That we, and it is in many ways, I think it is our most our most uh, non, it's a non-negotiable, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we have remedied it, but we have done it mostly as doctrine, at the level of doctrine. It is like going into Madame Tussaud and seeing a wax cabinet and there is uh, holistic anthropology, but there is no lived lives, you know, there's not, <coughs> so they claim that our anthropological advance is a is a halfway house it hasn't really made it into its uh, the way what it means in lived reality and <coughs> just on on paul here just one one thought here so it <coughs> says about paul that he says i am happy i i didn't baptize many i didn't because god sent me to preach and not to baptize Paul doesn't say anything about performing weddings <laughs> because he is not good at that. He didn't perform any weddings. Nobody would ask Paul to perform a wedding because Paul is on record saying it is better than to marry than to burn. <laughs> well, you know, he is not going to be our wedding spe <laughs> speaker. <clears throat> but maybe that is better, you know, yeah. in, in more than one way, you know, yeah. maybe. All right, um, some thoughts. So in three ways, uh, the history, theology, and practice. Um, you did, uh, one, uh, Paul had indicated that it is good to discuss that, um, the level of early Christian writers. And as good as Augustine is, I think Origen and Nyssa are far greater thinkers than he is, and that's my opinion. And, and, and by this reason, I'm thinking that the way they, somebody like Nyssa, for instance, when he writes on the essay on virginity, virginity meaning the sort of will that lands on a stream of water that goes into the branches of life, which is the reason why he wrote it that way, and the incapability of him to imagine that the more you birth, the more death there is, right? So the reason why virginity exists is so that death doesn't come upon you. So because this is the reason, then Christian thinking is about uh, self-preservation, right? And it also has this immortality uh, effect to one's being, right? Which is why Adventist theology fails often because it thinks far too much about heaven, right? Um, and we are immortals in a sense. Um, and it's interesting that n most of that heavenly thinking has no scriptural nuance to it. It is all based on a source of a dream. And it's curious that it, it has no embodied aspect to it in its engagement, right? So I'm glad that the fathers, let's call them the church fathers, have been brought into the conversation. And interestingly, about the sixth century, you have uh, Benedict rules, order, about how you should be controlling of the body making sure that the body isn't exposed to a particular thing, even not laughing, right? Because laughing would be a sin. Because life is meant to mirror time itself. It's supposed to be the click of life or the clock of life, right? Um, so all this development is to say that now we are here, 21st century, 22nd, whatever. Um, we are in a position of which the reality that we live in um, engages us between the text, church, and people who really want to have sex, right? Or that's the idea. Because when we think about the sort of discussion that we're talking about, no one really wants to or wants to talk about sex because we're sex-infused people. It's been like feeding on us, right? Um, so part of that is to kind of rewire. Let's rethink about what we truly mean by human beings and how God acts upon them, which is what I think your text is getting to. Um, thinkers about God today are going back to the church fathers, Sarah Coakley, uh, 
even your daughter, Lynn Marie Tonstadt, she's kind of pointed this out, that the way theology should move forward is that queering or queer theology is creating an alternative power to address the powers that have suppressed humanity, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what we appreciate about Lynn Marie, that she is creating the sort of language that engages the bodily form of the trueness of what it means to be a creature. Mm -hmm. And I think moving forward, a good Adventist theology must speak more heavily about what it means to be human. I don't think we really have a good, th there was a book that was published a couple years ago by a close by uh, organization in the church that attempted to address what a human being is. And it was biblical studies. The Greek says this, and quite honestly, from the pastoral side, the book failed because it didn't talk about will, it didn't talk about desire, it hardly spoke about sexual passions, it hardly spoke about intent uh, and eschatological will, the desires of the being, and so forth, right? Which is, this is what we're wanting. And only to say this, that to talk about the human being is to then talk about God. And I think what scares us most of the times of why we're still disgusted is because we picture ourselves not really here. We're really not this. We're really not that bad. We're really not that, you know, awful as creatures at all, whatever that means. We're really already on the uh, seventh cloud that we're gonna stop on Sabbath and say hi to everybody there and then for the future, right? So, um, yeah, so thank you for those thoughts and I think uh, we should queer more um, because the more you queer, this is, you're like, what's going on? <laughs> Theology is a good way of queering because it revokes, provokes us to go back to think about what the heck started all of this anyway? And you know who was disgusted at the queer God? It was the very people who thought God could not be this. Mm. And it was the one who showed up in Jerusalem. Mm. You realize that. And so from disgust to humanity, God, this weird one, but it was this one. Right? Kind of changes the flavor. <clears throat> well, I don't have much, <clears throat> much to add. I, I think you have expanded on some things that I touched on and, and done it very nicely. But... Uh, uh, you have, we have mentioned my daughter, Lynn Marie, <coughs> who uh, went to school at La Sierra for many years, studied at Yale, and now is uh, <coughs> teaching at Yale. And, uh, and she wrote her dissertation on the Trinity, a critique of uh, uh, the Catholic Trinitarian uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar and the Protestant uh, Wolfhard Pannenberg. You know, these are very difficult theologians, and I try to to tag along for a while in her journey, and then I sort of fell off. You know, with biblical studies is much simpler. <laughs> it's, it's quite, and I, I like it more. But the question come up, is the Trinity, uh, is God a, a male? Is God male? Sure. Or is God female? Uh, what is your word? Is, it male? is God male or female? Well, you don't say, because yes, it's male, yes, female, but different, right? Different. God must be different, because there is male and not, ma I mean, there is not, you cannot pigeonhole it on male and female. And what about hierarchy? Is God, Father, Son, is it hierarchical or is it non-hierarchical? So she thinks, yes, God is neither male nor female or both male and female, and many things in between. And the Trinity is not hierarchical. I thought she had done a very good job, you know, the, the critiquing those. <coughs> but her conclusion in the sort of theology she does is that God is different. And queer is a word for being different. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you know, you might just end up uh, thinking something about God that is quite unsayable. But God is different. We are not uh, completely like God. You know? So I, 
I think there is room for for stretching some of our concepts here. Maybe just a quick implication is that here's God and Jesus is a male, Holy right? Spirit, yeah. And then the Holy Spirit is just like the babysitter, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, to make it fun, right? Like this is the family of God. And there, therefore we have to have families to reflect a God of families, right? And so that's the, the implication in a, in a fun way so we could laugh a little bit more. Well, I'm tempted to, to just add to this conversation. You, you, you have three males up there, you know, who are the parents of humanity, and look what we're discussing right now. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, and, and that's why it's very important that we, 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 talk, we, we review our God language, and I think the Episcopal Church is, is spearheading the, the project on reviewing our language about God because it uh, reflects a male language that continues to marginalize the other half of humanity. So um, it's, very, it's a very important conversation. Now, I'd like to ask this question and throw it out to the panel before um, I come here. Now, you spoke about um, Adventist uh, resistance of the Platonic dualism that has um, taken over. Now, <clears throat> I think the feminist critique is that this Platonic dualism is, is, is a spawn of patriarchy, where uh, materiality is seen in the feminine sphere and uh, to be conquered and to be you know, exploited, whereas the spiritual sphere is a sphere of God uh, where, the male, um, uh, where the male resides. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to find out whether this disgust uh, that we see coming through in Romans, to what extent is it uh, uh, steeped in a patriarchal culture of dominance? Uh, just to ask. Who wants to take that up? I don't know. I don't know. Was that to someone specific? No? Okay. All right. So because I was actually thinking afterwards, I was well, like, oh, I should yes. have added. Was this, okay, I can answer this one? Yes, you okay. can answer that. <laughs> and then we, can, we, can, we can move on to pass the fever, get ready to answer that. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry, um, I'll be quick. Um, so one of the things that the church fathers did, and I have some of the quotes from this in my book, is they took this disgust for sexuality and they placed that on the woman. So the woman was the tool that Satan used in order to entice the man into these awful sexual things. So, so the woman is closely associated with the serpent in the garden. And so this is a way of shifting sin and temptation onto the woman, who also, by the way, is the emotional one and um, the compassionate one. And this persists in our day to day where you take, you take the impulses of compassion and empathy and love and care, you place those on the woman you strip them from the man, to whom they are also natural, and then you degrade the woman. And this is another way of making um, compassion and justice, uh, decrediting, discrediting compassion and justice. And you see that play out very much today when you hear people trying to separate um, logic from compassion. They'll be like, oh, okay, so you're, it's hurting people, fine, but that's not a logical argument. You know, you'll hear these kinds, this kind of rhetoric is playing exactly into that. Yeah, ju uh, just a comment on Olive's uh, point there on the sort of patriarchy. Now, there is a stark reading, etymological reading of the Eden Garden, of Eden story that is uh, I almost wish I had never seen it, because it was ruinous to the idyllic picture of Adam and Eve, you know, in the in paradise. But one, uh, the etymology of the story is really, in some ways, quite pa patriarchal. You might say. I I think there may be another way of doing it, so you could mute that that type of image, but patriarchal in the sense that the male, I mean the terminology used is male as someone who penetrates and female as someone who is penetrated. 
And there is an inequality there. There is a male dominance in some ways. It is very much it's sort of pro-male, that reading. You know, that if you take that all the way in there and, and do it read that etymologically as someone has done, it is quite, quite shattering to our Friday night peace because it doesn't look so nice anymore. Now, I think there is maybe other ways of doing it, so I, I don't want that to be, to, to linger. <laughs> but it has, been, it has been looked at from that perspective. Um, I think that um, starting in Genesis, we uh, see, we read the story as God curses this woman. God hates this woman to some degree. And we kind of think that because, and, and Christian history has taught us this, that um, because God thinks of her less, it's okay for us to think of her less. Yeah. And then you kind of go on through Genesis, and then you have the story of Noah, and then you have, well, certain people from certain parts of the world came from Ham, and this was theology that was in the Christian church, right? So certain people came from Ham, and God cursed these people, and they're from Africa. The North, Northern Africa is what Christian, the, you know, we, we say. And so because God cursed these people, it's okay for us not to like them. And so you kind of go through scripture and then you see, well, who does God not like? Because if God doesn't like them or God puts them away or God curses them, then it's okay for me to not like them and for me to treat them as less. And then you come down to Romans. Um, and yet, what we see throughout the Old Testament and then in the New Testament and mostly in Jesus, where he says, no, I love everyone. And he comes into a world that is very classified and very, you know, certain people are here, certain people are here, and there's all of these categories. And what does Jesus do? What he does is completely radical in the ancient world. In any culture you look at, there was, you know, um, Poor people deserved to be poor. They were cursed by God. If you had a disability, it was because what happened with the blind man, right? Who sinned? So if he sinned, then it's okay for him to be blind. It's okay for him to be a beggar on the side of the street. Um, and yet Jesus says, no, that's not how it is. That's how you understood it to be. But I'm here to show you exactly what God meant, exactly what God intended. This idea of love your neighbor as yourself, that's not a New Testament idea. That's all the way back in Leviticus. Um, that's not a new thing that Jesus says. He is restating what has already been said because they had forgotten what that actually meant because they thought just because certain people, you know, we often, when, we, when we read scripture and we read the Old Testament, sometimes we read it as a Western document. It's not a Western document. It's a very Eastern document. The things it's talking about culturally are very Eastern ideas. And so culturally, what we talked about earlier today, culturally, there were some things that were just acceptable that are still acceptable in certain cultures. And because the way the culture at the time interpreted it, it says, well, God thinks less of her, so I can think less of her. God thinks less of certain races because they are cursed, so I can think less of them. Um, and we forget, you know, uh, we were taught, you, you, you mentioned interracial marriage. There was a time we talked about today where that was a moral issue, right? So it's not a, it was not just a legal issue. It was a moral issue. Mm -hmm. As far back as 2018, 20% of our country still thinks inter interracial marriage is morally wrong. It's 2018. Um, and so, uh, it is where God is showing us, you were wrong in how you understood these things, and now I'm giving you a different paradigm and how to understand these things. Thank you. Um, were you going to uh, make a point here? Uh, yes. Um, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to bring this conversation back to the central question that I think everybody's asking. And by the way, uh, uh, Pastor Pranitha, God did not curse anybody after the flood. It was Noah who cursed his grandson to his son. Um, yeah, but they're saying God cursed. God, God blessed them. It actually said God blessed his progeny of Noah. 
So it, it goes to show how we continue to distort the text, and I'm saying that because we're continuing to distort text so that we can marginalize entire groups of people. But bring us back to the central question. And I think one of the big uh, uh, fears in this weekend summit is that uh, uh, we're going to come here to advocate the, gay, the, the, the queer lifestyle. And, and so that has been a, a big fear as far as this summit is concerned. And as at the beginning and even at the end, uh, Dr. Tanston is saying, we're not here to advocate anything. And what I hear in your presentation is, we're not here to advocate anything. We are here to say that perhaps God does not hold certain people in disgust or certain things in disgust the way we as Christians hold them in disgust. And I think that is what uh, uh, Dr. T Tansel and everyone else is saying here. Let us look at it differently than we have been looking at it. Um, and I think already we have learned from the presentation that uh, nobody catches queerness. Um, if, you, if you caught it, that's what you were in the first place, okay? <laughs> and, and if you chose to be queer, that's what you were in the first place. And, and so that's very important that we understand that. So what this conversation is trying to do is to challenge our understanding and how we look at persons because the fact is, the reality is, when we look at a queer person, the first thing we see is imagining them in uh, some kind of bodily contact with somebody with whom they should not be in bodily contact with. So the whole question of bodies has come up. I don't know how we could have this conversation without coming, coming here. So we ask the question now, how do we mitigate these concerns as to the extent to which when we discuss the question of affirming queer LGBTQ persons in our community and who they are as embodied beings, how do we mitigate that fear? Uh, yes. I'm gonna jump on this one because it's easy. <laughs> Knock it out of the park, I leave the theological up to the theologians and the, acad the academics. But I will say, from my perspective, I think it does all come back to fear. I think that fear is, fear causes us to do things that we never thought we would do. Fear causes us to hurt ourselves, hurt other people. And fear um, is, is fine, but to be overcome and act on fear may not always be the best thing. I will say this when it comes to mitigating those things. When it comes to um, LGBTQ persons who come into my office, more often than not, they don't care about the theology or what we're, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. They care about they're in crisis looking for somebody to help them. And I think that as a, as a church, as universities, under the, under the banner of Christianity, we have failed. We have failed to just embrace and to just be there for people who are in crisis, who are suffering, who are going through a whole gamut of life. And I feel that as, as ministers, as university leaders, as church people, that we need to do better to just be there. And I think in the most simplest terms, I think it comes back to what was already said, just love God and love people. And I think that's what is at the heart of, of it. But if we're honest, maybe we don't really love people. Maybe we don't really love God all that much. Oh. Maybe wow. we just tell ourselves these things. And we've told ourselves these lies over and over again, and we tend to believe it because we do the right things. Mm. And so I would, my, my thing comes back to I think searching our own hearts, 
making sure that we're right with God, and then opening our, opening our arms to be there and to just walk alongside individuals wherever they're at and whatever they're going through. Also, I would like to start by saying um, during lunch, I was sitting with Alicia and I was sitting with Paul Anthony, Paul Anthony, and uh, I was educating them on the heterosexual lifestyle. <laughs> I said that we dress up on Sabbaths and we go to church. After that, we have a vegetarian meal. <laughs> And then after that, when the sun sets, we have sex in the dark and we don't see. And so all of us heterosexuals here know what I'm talking about because we have the heterosexual lifestyle. Words matter. And when you say uh, homosexual uh, lifestyle, you're automatically placing yourself in a category of far behind the times, not invested in the issue. You haven't read on anything. You haven't spoken to uh, queer people. So it's very important that we get words right. Imagine this. Imagine there's something about you, whether it's the color of your skin, the color of your hair, whether it's what country you're from, uh, anything really, if you wear glasses. And then there had to be a conference where people come together to uh, say from the front that, no, 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 uh, white people are not bad. They're actually good. They're not disgusting. People with glasses, they're good. You know, they just can't see straight all the time. But you put the glasses on there, and they're good people. <laughs> and you had to spend all this energy to convince folk that a certain group of people are not disgusting. Imagine the trauma that that causes on those people who are in that specialized group uh, to hear over and over and over again. Uh, and then all of the microaggressions. And then on top of that, to ask them to come and share and say, hey, we're really not disgusting. We're good people. Look, it says God loves us here and here. And to have Alicia and Paul Anthony here today just shows the Christ in them bursting forward, the resilience, the them not giving up on Adventists, uh, the them wanting to take the church to a, a more realized conception of what Christ had for us and our church. So thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Paul Anthony. I don't think you're disgusting. I never have. <laughs> And I don't think that the way that you love and show up in this world is disgusting. I love you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, I see Pastor Chavez. I see Chris Carcamo. And uh, I'm going to take it. And then once I see these hands, once you get this, now you have half, I have to go down to 30 seconds to ask you a question. Pastor Savez, Chris Carcamo, uh, Maya. Uh, uh, oh, I thought it was uh, uh, was not Elvis. Uh, and, and I'm making sure we get Chuck's hand because yesterday he sort of yielded um, to to the time. W what's your name? Uh, okay, good good to have you, Pastor. And uh, and the uh, uh, Chuck Sandy for. Okay, let's. You have 30 seconds, y'all. All right. I have to give you 10 seconds. All right, good. I ask you, what kind of pushback do you receive from upper levels of the church regarding this? I did not receive pushback from upper levels, but there is, was a, 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 a lady who um, identified herself as a 62-year-old American um, from some state or other. She called the president's office. She called um, HR. She called me, and she threatened us that if we put the summit on, she'll make sure everybody she knows does not attend or send their kids to WAU. Um, and of course, um, I recognize there and then that many pastors have run away from this conversation because of those very threats. If we minister and pastor based on the threats 
of people who themselves have not yet found the freedom that is in Christ, our church is in trouble. Yeah. I'm saying that. But I'm just putting in my little sermon today. All right, is that, was that your question? All right. Um, so, Chris. I'm just going to try to distill two chapters of my book. Um, <laughs> this is what I'm going to try to do. Uh, most of the time, people will talk about, people will identify that Jesus is referring back to Leviticus 18 when he discusses cornea. Um, I spent a lot of time on this because as Adventists, we don't write off the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible, so it's important. And we don't just, you know, you, we don't just dismissively, you know, you read, people dismissively say like, Oh, but, you know, we eat shellfish, you know, we go to church on Sunday, so we don't have to pay attention to that. That doesn't work for us. Um, Leviticus chapter 18, um, if we look at that as a definition of pornea, I'm not entirely convinced that's the best approach, but that is the most common kind of, of way of looking at it text on text. Um, so it's been said Leviticus chapter 18 is a reference to um, the ideal sexuality in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the problem with that is there are 20, there are 20 rules in Leviticus chapter 18. Um, 15 of them are about incest. And the final, obviously, let's not think too hard on this, but um, incest could not have been prohibited in Genesis 1 and 2. Do we have some recognition? You know what I'm saying? Okay. So it clearly does not refer to Genesis 1 and 2. That's three-fourths off the top. Um, the others don't, it, it's really hard to see how they could possibly take, be taken from the text of Genesis 1 and 2. Um, what it does seem to be is a text that is, uh, every, every one of them is addressed to the male head of house who has pretty much absolute power over the whole household and is limiting who he cannot have sex with. It would have been much more simple to say only have sex between a married man and woman, right? This, this little bumper sticker, one man, one woman thing that doesn't show up in the Bible, like why doesn't it just say that if that's what it meant? Why doesn't it actually seem to refer to Genesis 1 and 2 if that's what it refers to? So if we take the Bible and we compare it to the Bible and we try to determine what it's talking about, then we end up first in Genesis chapter 9. Um, I'm just going to, this is going to be such a quick version of this that you're going to be like, I don't know if that makes sense, but it does make sense if you read my you read my book if you look into it. Um, so, so Genesis chapter 9, you see this story of Noah. Uh, he survives this apocalyptic event and immediately like, gets drunk as fast as he possibly can, right? And so he's laying in his tent after he's, after he's made wine and gotten completely drunk, and he's laying naked in his tent. Um, and his son, son Ham comes and sees him naked. And his response... Um, it, there's, there's a sexual overtone there, but it doesn't appear to be a sexual act. And his response is to go humiliate his father by telling his brother. It's a power move uh, of humiliating his father who he should be honoring and respecting. His brothers respond by uh, restoring their father's honor. Fast forward to the, and then Ham, because of this, is, is cursed. Um, and it's, and, he's, and he's, he's cursed and his, his descendants are Canaan. Fast forward, the next time you encounter Canaan is Abraham and Lot are looking out to divide the land, and we're talking about suddenly Sodom and Gomorrah. So now you have, now you, and this, I'm just going to say this is a very problematic narrative of, of a scripture, because going back to the story of Ham, it is a justification for the enslavement of the Canaanites. And so I don't want to pass by this without saying this is very problematic uh, because of what it justifies, slavery. 
Um, but what, what you have then is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is the same thing that Ham was doing, but it's full grown now. While Abraham respects and honors the visitors, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah does everything they can to strike terror in the hearts of the visitors. And so what, the, what this is is a story of attempted gang rape. It's a sexual assault for violent and political purposes. They do not want to welcome foreigners and strangers in their, in their country. We in America have a history of doing things to also let um, people know that we don't want foreigners in this country by terrorizing them in various different ways. This is the behavior of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is what this behavior was used for in the text. If you allow the text to define the text, what you find happening is these kinds of behaviors. And so then when you come to Leviticus 18, um, and it says, you sh a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, because this was humiliating to treat a man like a woman. And you find also at the end of Leviticus 18 that it says, for such they did in this land before you came here, which was the land of Canaan, which is Sodom and Gomorrah, which is where this happened before they came. And you also find the connection between that behavior and um, things that are considered an abomination. So that is a very fast summary. Thank you. And you know what? You answered two questions that came from online in doing that as well. OK? The whole question of Leviticus 18.22, a man shall not lie with a because <laughs> Yes. All right. Um, who was next? Uh, it was uh, Maya. that any type, type of queer act is a sin, then there's a whole slew of consequences to that. If we're reading the Bible and we're saying the queer act is not about sinning, it's a cultural issue, then there's a whole slew of consequences. I'm a marriage and family therapist, so for me, differentiating what's abuse and not abuse is really important. Mm -hmm. And the topic of what is spiritual abuse has been on my mind for a while. So I know we're not trying to make conclusions here. I know that that's been very carefully done. We're not trying to advocate for the LGBT community, uh, community in that way. I know that's very carefully done. But how do we wrestle with this idea that if we read it wrong, there's a whole set of repercussions that's really harmful to a lot of families, Christian families? Uh, who wants to tackle that one? Thank you for your comment. Um, not that it's intended for me, but um, as a pastor of a large church, um, the church, not my church, but the church as a whole, is illiterate about power. It doesn't know what it means when it speaks it, when it does it, and so forth. Um, and everything in regards to spiritual power is kind of this unknown friend or enemy that we have that revolves around us when we go to the text, when we treat people a certain way, and so forth, um, which causes um, the tool, like the Bible, to become a weapon, right? It harms marriages, as you know. It harms relations in the church, and it harms how we describe the roles in the church. Um, and we can only expect more of it, right? Um, part of your comment is that there are consequences to every single angle that you do, which to think about such a sa summit we could say, oh, it's too intellectual, it's too academic, um, I want practical stuff, you know, just is to not be aware that it requires exposure and limitations of definitions that we speak responsibly in light of those terms that could be powerful or powerless, right? So we have to appreciate this sort of discussion because it creates barriers, stop signs, green lights, 
red lights to be able to have a dialogue that is healthy and that it reimagines power in all those corners, right? So that is just a pastoral angle. And I think that when we broad brush all that, people will be hurt. I'll just also quickly say that, you know, Jesus said that all the law and prophets hang on love. And uh, love does not hang on the law and prophets. I got this from Alicia. Uh, so what happens is when we read scripture and uh, there's something that we see in the law and the prophets that cause us to be unloving, we know automatically we're reading it wrong because, um, you know, we don't derive love from uh, the, the law and the prophets. It's, we start with love first, and then our understanding of Scripture comes in because God is love. He said, you, you shall know them. Uh, they shall know you by your love. Uh, the greatest command is to love God and to love our neighbor. There's so much emphasis on love, but so many things that we do, um, they're unloving, and we're just like, well, that's just what the Bible says. Um, and it, don't blame me, blame God. And so that's not a right reading when we have this whole host of witness of how powerful love is and how central love is to everything, that if you remove love, everything falls apart. All and right. so we have to stick with that. Thank you so much. And um, let's know we are, we are over time. And if you will allow us, maybe we could go. Is 5.30 okay? Uh, yes, we could go to 5.30. Huh. And uh, let's go to Charles Sandifor, um, that we you yielded last night because the time was going. Oh, you have a new one. <laughs> Thanks for the relief here. <laughs> I have been waiting for someone to come after me for using the word queer to say exactly that. I've been waiting for it. <laughs> with biblical ones, and then we take the Bible and we weaponize it and we use it as building material for a whole social structure. So that even if we change our point of view about Romans 1, we're still left with the church that says that some people can't be baptized, that some people can't be ordained, that some people can be fired, that some people can be kicked out of school, that some people can't be members of our church. And that can continue even though we've changed our mind about the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a now what about this, Dr. Hemmings, that we can talk in the panel, but here we need to act differently. And my own response to my question would be that we act subversively locally, not try to act subversively globally and by subversive, we live out the law of love of the gospel. And we began to do that because change in the church happens from the margins inside. Change is centripetal, not centripetal. No GC committee ever changed the church. My God. <laughs> the GC committee responded to change in the church mm -hmm. in its best moments, tries to hinder it in its worst. Mm. All right, thank you. Did you want to make a comment? <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, and thank you, Maya, for that. Um, it's very important. I just want to say, I just want, I have to say this, friends. The sacred text of any religion is the most powerful, powerful instrument of the religion. It can be used to do great harm, and it can be used to do great good. Ephesians 5, 21, 22 has been used to cause death to many women. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Those texts have been used to actually cause death. 
So we have to be very careful about the sacred text. That is what we've been doing this weekend. Tread softly, because we're using the text as a, an, a, a, a what did I say, a, 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 a weapon to whip up disgust against different groups in society that we find to be not according to you know, the norm. And we know what the norm. I, there's a pastor, I'm going to come. Pastor at the back there. Is it, did I, did I overlook anyone else? Was there a hand up before? Yeah. Okay, then I come to past pastor. Okay, yes. sermon this morning. Pastor Marientos, I really appreciate your ministry. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing uh, a graduate of Andrews University, uh, Liberty University, um, and I'm still learning a lot, uh, even with some of my patients, uh, um, when I have to deal with, uh, I'm struggling with this, uh, uh, with this issue. Um, but I'm, I'm hearing here two Gospels because I'm still trying to figure out why, why, why was it that Christ died on the cross again? What, what, what did he die for? I mean, we can like um, equivocate about, I'm just, I'm just learning, I just wanted to know. We can equivocate about sin and I have a lot to unlearn. I have a lot to unlearn because as I read scripture, you know, in my mind, scripture is clear in terms of why Christ died. He died for sin. I mean, to, to get us out of sin. That's why maybe if, maybe that's wasn't why he died. I don't know. Um, and in my thinking and in teaching that um, the Godhead, the Trinity, is reflected in what he did with Adam and Eve. If I'm wrong about that, just tell me my theology is wrong. And um, I don't think that God has been capricious in anything that he did. Whatever he did, he did as God, he did as sovereign. And, um, and so I, I am confused in terms of uh, um, what was presented here today. I know this is maybe contrarian to the ethos that's been extant here today. Um, but I'm, I'm hearing two Gospels. And I am particularly, I want to be saved in God's kingdom. And I believe in my heart and soul that God says what he means, and he means what he says. I believe that. And uh, what I'm hearing is a different Gospel. That somehow, you know, yes, I agree with my dear brother, what he was saying. We need to be kind, and we need to draw, and the church, and my dear brother, the same thing, to, to be kind, but understand, first, you must understand sin is sin. And human beings, the, we can have anthropological arguments and with respect. But I believe that God says what he means, and he means what he said. And if a sinner is we come to him, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. But to say that, you know, to say that what I have done is not sin, and try to equivocate, to somehow equivocate that, in my thinking, in my thinking, it's, uh, it's, it's another gospel. That's all I'm saying. You know, scripture is clear. If you confess your sins, the Lord says that he is faithful, he's ready and willing to forgive. But to say somehow it's not sin, and somehow talks about marriage equality, equality to what? It, well, we got your question, but we didn't talk about marriage equality. But, uh, but you, you can answer the question. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so there are, there are many ways to go about answering this concern. Um, one, of, one of my big concerns for us as Avenists is this notion of the text is clear. The idea that when I look at scripture or any text, any situation in life really, and that the meaning as it jumps off the page for me is the absolute um, irrefutable meaning of the text is all kind of problematic and it's far from Adventist. Um, our Adventist pioneers were very open to the fact, hey, the way I'm looking at scripture right now, it, I think it's right, but I could be wrong. We can look at the life of Ellen White and how many different things that she had to go through and how she changed her views about the Sabbath, the things that she thought she should be eating, um, the 1844 and different things like that. So at our core as Adventists, I believe is an openness to how I'm seeing something right now might actually not be right. It's progressive revelation, progressive truth, right? Well, let's live, let's live up to that. So we have to be careful about um, the text is clear. Sin is sin. Yes, sin is sin, but what is sin? That's the, that's the question that we're, that's what we're actually somewhat getting to discuss. Um, and one, one of my uh, favorite one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Robert Scharf, talks about the, uh, the impossibility of trying to come to a new paradigm of thinking about something from within a paradigm that you're currently operating. In other words, if you have been raised to believe a certain thing about, tradi about marriage, the traditional biblical sex ethic, it is impossible, epis epistemically impossible, for you to arrive at another paradigm from within the paradigm that you're operating. In other words, if you're within this paradigm that you were raised to believe is correct, that paradigm is always going to seek to justify itself and the conclusions that proceed from it. That's how paradigms work. They are meant to be self-substantiating. They are not meant to yield to a new paradigm. So when Dr. Tonstadt, Tonstadt and Alicia and, and those who have done excellent work in this field um, when they come with a new paradigm, we have to, the only way that we're going to be able to give their new way of looking at this a fair shot is not going to be from within or on the footing of the traditional paradigm. The only way we're going to give it a new concern, a new way of looking at it is falling back into the world, sinking back into the world, and getting to know queer people. Like, I don't, I don't know your name, you said you're a... You, Maya. Maya is a marriage and family counselor. She has to do work with, I imagine, with LGBT people, or she's just with people every day, getting to know their life circumstances. And she's able to, I imagine, I'm speaking for your life, but her Christianity and her reading of the Bible is going to be with respect to her getting to know people, not her continuing to put a paradigm that she might have been raised with on life but instead coming out of life and looking at the word of God in turn. Um, so again, this one, we really wanna flag that the whole notion of the scripture is clear. The fact that we're here today means the scripture is not clear. It's not clear for some people, it's not as clear. Um, so let's do a better job as Adventists of talking about the clarity of scripture and recognize that sometimes the scripture is clear has been the foreground, the foreground for harming LGBT people and others. All right, let's hear, can you hear from the past? <laughs> it's, it's just the time and I just want to get as many people in, but you can, you can respond to it if, if it relates to you and then you know, continue on that one. Well, we want to get that hand in. And um, also, I, I'm trying to uh, economy of time here um, because uh, there's another program over in, at 5.30, which I do not want to encroach on it. Um, where one asked, what does it mean to advocate, advocate in uppercase, for life, for a lifestyle? So I want to throw that out here, maybe at the end, but Pastor, what's your name? Uh, Pastor Sanders. Pastor Sanders, um, can you get your question? Half a second, half a minute. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, you know, Pastor, you brought up a very good point that as a church, uh, we are so focused on heaven. Um, it's even in our ideology of preaching the three angels' messages to the entire world. And yet, the topic of queer sexuality is one uh, that focuses heavily on life here right now. And so my question is, how do we as a church uh, begin to 
balance this tension of preparing ourselves for eternity while also doing a life here, uh, a justice and being able to speak more so to the issues and uh, not even just issues, but topics that are relevant to how we are living even now. Um, let's give an example for uh, Romans. You can help me out. Uh, Romans doesn't talk you about. Have one no, minute to respond. Romans Pastor. doesn't talk about. I'm th I'm trying to put this down as an example. Um, let's think about Romans, right? Romans doesn't talk about uh, the devil. Doesn't talk about the second coming. It doesn't talk about heaven. That's just Romans. Romans is interested in life, the resurrected life not the one in the eschaton, but it is what Paul would refer to as being alive to God. Eugene P Peterson is the one who said it best. He says, we are now able to live and practice the resurrected life. You and I practice resurrection because the one who, in whom we have our life is alive. Because of Jesus, we are alive. And therefore, we practice it already, not in its consumption form. But that is to say that you can't do aliveness to God without heaven. And I'll just keep it at that. So, uh, because then you're going to push me to think about critique New Testament eschatology. It's not really interested in the leaving world side type of thing. Preparation for the second coming is a parable. We put too much emphasis on that. Uh, the virgins, the lamp, that's, it's a parable. Um, I'm interested more if we have our life already in Christ. I think we're pretty good to go. Yeah. Alicia, you have a burning response. Uh, can, you, can you do it in it's a half a minute? not uncommon for me, a half minute. <laughs> Here's, I think, one of the more important things of the many things I would like to say is that we've been having a discussion, frankly, about heterosexual sins against our community. And we've been talking specifically about the sin of disgust. I hope you would listen, sir, because you are the one who brought this up. Um, we've been having a conversation about heterosexual sin, particularly the sin of disgust that heterosexuals have had towards the queer community. And Jesus said that you look at the speck of dust in another person's eye and you are not paying attention to the log in your own eye, better to remove the log from your own eye that you may see clearly in order to be able to take and help your neighbor with the speck of dust in their eye. And this, I think, is the process that the church has not followed of taking the log out of their own eye. And this is a log that has a lot of historical uh, underpinnings, as we've been talking about, that go back many centuries that really need to be deconstructed, the disgust which, which we have in, in, we have given to many people and their bodies. And so I, I think it is disturbing to me that every time we start talking about ways that heterosexual Christians need to uh, amend their behavior, the temptation is to jump quickly to the sins of the LGBT community. Can we begin by not to, treating us with disgust and recognizing our humanity and work on that for a while? And then maybe we can get to the theology and see clearly at that point. Yes, as am I, sir. And the cross of Christ should remove the disgust for which we have for one another. And it should be something that could, should convict us of our own sins. We are all sinners. All of us are sinners. <laughs> yes. It's also interesting that um, okay. God does that, that mean nice what he exchange. says. That was a nice exchange. I will also say that it's interesting that God, um, this idea, God, does God mean what he says and does he say what he means about slavery then when we talk about slavery uber nuance gets into the discussion right. mm -hmm. we talk about oh but this word in greek is a slavery and uh, this word over here is that and then we understand everything uh in different <laughs> ways but anyway Ellen White was a woman of color. She married, uh, she 
she married uh, Jane's wife, Abraham. He had six children with, uh, not Zephora, but um, Keturah. So Keturah was an Egyptian. And so and Abraham, not Sarah. And of course, Shulamith. Shulamith, her father, was the pharaoh of Egypt. I've never seen uh, a Caucasian uh, Egyptian. But what I'm saying is, uh, you may refer to that. I don't know what the implication is. All I'm simply talking about is that Christ and his cross, and Christ died for sin. And to try to say that uh, St. Paul in, in the book of Romans did not, did not, was not inspired or did not say what he did say, and to say that uh, Leviticus, um, I'm simply saying that, you know. No one's saying those things, sir. No one has said those things. No one has said those things, sir. But, but thank you. I, I yes, so I, I think what she's trying to say, that was not the, that was not the point made. Uh, we said perhaps the opposite. That was not the discussion this afternoon or any time this weekend. So um, perhaps you can go back, listen to um, the tape and... and, and Uh, I'm, uh, we are studying the scripture because we believe in its inspiration. That's precisely why we're studying it. If we did not, we would put it aside and study something else. All right, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so there's one question here I'd like to end with, and we're really over time. And, and the question comes from um, the listening uh, online audience. What does it mean to advocate for a lifestyle I want to end, this is a good question, so you have the last here online. What does it mean to advocate for a lifestyle? Can you answer this question now in the context of all that we have done this weekend? Yes, I want to start with the straight people. Um, <laughs> I'm neutral. <laughs> We're assuming. We're assuming. <laughs> What does it mean to advocate? I think that in my context, it's creating spaces that we talked about previous that are safe and affirming. And I think that that is the, um, that is the beginning. It is not the end, but it is a, a start to where advocacy can begin. But furthermore, I think if you wanna just go beyond the safe spaces and, uh, you know, um, I guess within my context on campus, it really begins with our own hearts and examining our own selves to seeing why, why wouldn't we want to be advocates? Um, I think to be an advocate, one, you have to hold space to hear people's stories. Um, and to create safe space, whether you agree with them or not, um, to be able to, to reflect what uh, the chaplain is saying, to um, s hold safe space, but then also to fight for the justice of people, just their humanity. Whatever our beliefs might be, whatever our opinions might be, um, every person should have justice, should be treated well, um, should have choices. And so I think advocacy is to also make sure we're protecting those four people. So you're saying we're, we're, we're not advocating a lifestyle, we're advocating for people. We, we, it's a question, are we equating people with lifestyle? Well, if so. I can make, so I'll, I'll say what Pastor Panitha just said in spirit and just a correction to the question, it's not a lifestyle, it's life. And therefore, that's why the principle, I mean, it, it's, just, it's, uh, it's a matter of being able to incorporate everything about life in general and be able to harness on that in creating that just and right life. And that's where I'm at. Be kind. Uh, engage in curiosity, lead with love, um, play pickleball. 
Uh, I'm, I'm kind of allergic to the word lifestyle because of how it has been weaponized against our communities and used to promote, as Dillis Brooks spoke about, this, the myth of the single story, the one way to be a queer person. Uh, there are people who are queer and are celibate because they believe that is what God has called them to. And I advocate for those people. There are people who are queer and follow different convictions more in line with mine and Paul Anthony's, and I advocate for us as well. I advocate for gospel liberty, for people to do their best to seek the face of God. I do not believe that this issue is one that should divide the church. We historically have landmarks of the faith in the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Somebody's going to help me if I can't remember them all. They're all a bunch of S's, right? The Sabbath, the state of the dead, um, the sanctuary, the salvation, the second coming. Soul These, scriptura. Soul scriptura. <laughs> 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 Good one. Uh, <laughs> we have core doctrines of the Adventist church. I, I would very much like to live in a world uh, where Adventists of good faith could disagree and still remain in communion with one another. I would like to make space for those who disagree me, with me, and I would like those who disagree with me to make space for me as well. I would like for when someone comes into the office of their pastor or their teacher or someone that they respect as an elder and says, I, I think I'm gay, I think I'm transgender, I would like for that spiritual leader to be aware that the burden of how this person decides to live their life is one that they will have to bear for the rest of their life. And that as such, it's a decision that they need to make for themselves in full conviction and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I advocate for that. I advocate for us all to have choices in terms of trying to live the lifestyle that God has called us to. And there are a lot, you know, lifestyle is, is not a monolith and it's not a description of a community. That's what, I, that's what I advocate for, is gospel freedom and the ability for us to unite on what it means to be Adventist and not make a bunch of extra rules because we like to follow in the evangelical fundamentalism. Um, I would say in brief, um, we're supposed to advocate for life. Um, it doesn't matter what someone's lifestyle, I hate that word, but if you want to use that word, how, no matter how someone styles their life, um, we are, as Christians, supposed to advocate for life. So if you see people who are being harmed, namely LGBT people or women or people of color or immigrants or Muslims or whoever it is, your responsibility is to advocate for their life, bottom line. And if you allow conversation or your disagreement with their lifestyle to get in the way, you're not, advocate, you're not advocating for life and you're not standing with Jesus, who is the word of life. Thank you. Beautiful. We are not advocating for lifestyle. We're advocating for life. As I said at the opening, for too long the conversation on this issue has been death dealing. It is time the conversation become life affirming. We're talking about lives. And I thank uh, Dr. Tunstan for taking us on this biblical journey. I thank the pastors in the field. Did you have a question? Yes, I will give you the last say. And I thank Dr. Tunstad since I started this. Don't steal my thunder here. <laughs> I thank Dr. Tunstad for taking on this journey. I thank you, Paul Anthony and uh, Alicia. I thank you so much for coming among us and uh, not thinking that we will stone you. <laughs> we thank God. <laughs> no one. Uh, thank you, Pastor Danny Chisto, and thank you for all the, uh, our Sligo pastors and our chaplain for being here and for carrying this conversation. Now I'll hand the last word over before I give all the recognition and both and thanks uh, to Dr. Tonstead. So I came here on a textual assignment. We were going to read Romans, and Romans 1 especially. There was never a more inspired person in the history of Christianity than the Apostle Paul. He was truly inspired. 
when he dictated the letter to the Romans, he was also inspired by news from the field that there were co the counter missionaries that he had encountered in Galatia. They were branching out. They were doing other things in, other, in, in, in the wake of his mission. He writes a letter, he dictates a letter. It is very urgent because the Gentile mission is in jeopardy. It might just come to grief. He sends the letter urgently to Rome. And Phoebe, who brought the letter, she reads it in the Roman house churches. The voice of the counter-missionaries, we can hear it in the letter to the Romans. We hear it in Romans 1, 18 to 32. That's how they talk. That is their stump speech. It is exaggerated. It is not a good description of human reality. It is in some ways, uh, in uh, many ways, just not, uh, not a precise uh, account of, human, of the human situation. And there is a forceful pushback in Romans chapter 2. Those are the parameters of the text as well. I have proposed to read it here. The wrath of God, not that. It is the compassion of God that dominates Romans. God's compassion, not God's wrath. And it is not human incalcitrance that offends. It is human need. That is the main thing in Romans. And God has had a solution to that because God is compassionate. And God has responded to human need. So you need to bracket Romans 1, 18 to 32. Whatever take home message you have from it, you have to entertain the possibility that you are hearing the voices of the counter missionaries. I began my journey in, uh, way back in Norway once sharing that text without understanding that part. I was going off abroad to, another, to study in Lebanon and I was thinking I would never see my villagers again. And I was working in a, in a power hydroelectric co company with other, uh, other workers. And one day at noon, I sat down with them. I had mimeographed Romans 1, 18 to 32. And I handed it out to them, and I said, I may never see you again, so I'd like to read this text to you. I, you know, I, tried, I thought I might just just, you know, convert them. And I read the text, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungo all ungodliness of those who suppress the, the truth and so on. <clears throat> I think you get the point. <laughs> I was preaching to them the gospel of the counter-missionaries. Wow. All right. We'll hand over now. Could you come up to the podium? Give your... So this is uh, Executive Pastor of Sligo Church. She will give our closing remarks. I'm too short for this podium. Um, there are, you know, when we talk about these types of things, uh, we often like to go to the Old Testament. So there's a couple of passages in the Old Testament that I'm not going to talk about, but there's a couple of passages in the Old Testament of divine disgust that I find fascinating. Um, because there's a prophet in the Old Testament that is conveying divine disgust to us. A disgust that is so vehement that he communicates to us that God, the divine, is so disgusted that he will not hear people's prayers. It's in Isaiah 1, and then you can also read it, Isaiah 58. The disgust is so vehement that the, his children are wondering, why are we praying and you will not listen? Why are we fasting and you don't hear us? Why are we keeping the Sabbath and we as Sabbath keepers should love this? Why do we keep keeping the Sabbath and you don't care? 
And so the sin that is disgusting God, and in Isaiah 1, it refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. What is the sin that God finds so disgusting, that the divine finds so disgusting, that he will not hear the prayers of his people? He will not heed to their fasting. He does not care about their Sabbaths. And it is oppression. That is the sin that God is so disgusted by. It is oppression when his children are are oppressing his other children. And in Isaiah 58, we Sabbath keepers love to quote verse 13 and 14. If you keep your feet from going your own way on the Sabbath, there's a a word there that I'm not going to get into because these are closing remarks, not a sermon. Um, that word is only found a dozen, handful, uh, a few dozen times in the Old Testament, and it's fine twice. Twice, and it is um, pleasure. You know, if you keep you, the, you keep from doing your own pleasure on the Sabbath, but it's actually oppression. What they were doing was oppressing people, even on the Sabbath. And we, as Sabbath keepers, should be more concerned about justice and not oppressing people than anyone else because the Sabbath commandment is steeped in justice. Going all the way back to Exodus where it says, it's not just rest for you, it is rest for your wife because thousands of years ago, did you care about rest for your wife? It was rest for your son and your daughter because thousands of years ago, did you care about, we had to do Thai labor laws recently, right? It was rest, what does the commandment say? It was rest for your male servant and your female servant because did we care about justice thousands of years ago for your servants? And so steeped in the Sabbath commandment that we are celebrating today is justice, is equality. It is saying you can't just make your female and male servant, your son and your daughter just work seven days a week. You have to recognize the humanity in them. You have to give them the dignity that God has put in them by letting them rest. Treat them like human beings. Actually also let your animals rest. And so as Sabbath keepers, justice and not oppressing people is so much more important to us as Sabbath keepers, yes. and something that, w- that is what we should advocate. And what is the sin that God is disgusted by? There's a verse in Matthew 5, and this is the last thing, there's a verse in Matthew 5 that we like to quote. Because what do pious people do? They pray and they fast and they keep the Sabbath and so forth. And yet God in Isaiah is disgusted. And then you come to Matthew 5, and there's a verse, and it says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we like to quote this in terms of our behavior and pious actions, do everything right. But if you read just the few verses before it, it's actually not about pious action at all. It is about how you love. So when it says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, it is saying, love perfectly. And how it describes this, it says, what good is it if if you love the people that it's easy for you to love? Not because there's something lacking in them, but because there's something lacking in you. And so what good is it if you love the people that you find it easy to love? Learn to love the people that you find it difficult to love. And the closing remarks is how do we advocate? It is by not oppressing. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the last person I'm going to thank this evening is our Vice President for Communications and Integrated Marketing. Now, he didn't outsource this streaming to anybody. You could have outsourced it, but he took it over himself to make sure it is done right. Thank you very much, VP Wiles, for this very faithful work you've done this weekend. God bless your work. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, you have been with us all weekend, we know that. But though you have resided here, other spirits have resided here. Spirits of fear, spirit of disgust, 
spirits of confusion. We do not condemn those, for everything comes from you. And so, God, we pray that you'll visit everyone in whatever way they have encountered and experienced this summit. I pray you'll visit us all and you'll bring us the freedom and the peace that we need to love each other and to bless your name by the way we treat our fellow humans. I pray God your blessing upon all those who presented this weekend. And I want to pray a special blessing upon Alicia Johnston and upon Paul Anthony Turner. I pray special blessing upon you, upon them, God, not because of partiality, but because you're partial to the least of these, those that we oppress, those that we look at differently. And I pray, God, that you'll be with them in their life, that you'll lift them up, and that you'll place them on the ground that you wish to place them of service. Show them the purpose for their lives. Protect them, set a hedge of protection around them that no one can penetrate without your express purpose. I pray for Dr. Tunstead, who comes to the scripture and seeks to read it and help us to hear the scripture the way the original author, authors, the original hearers heard it. I pray you'll continue to bless his work. Protect him, God, from those who will seek to malign him. I beg you, God, that you'll continue to be with this university. I pray you'll bless us in all we do as we seek to follow after the Christocentric life and the Christocentric teaching that we have pledged to do. Show us how to do it well. And I pray, God, that you will protect every aspect of this university's work. I pray now, God, that you will bless all those, even those who at this time curse us for this summit. Bless them. And we pray you pray you bless this summit. May it bear fruit, fruits of redemption, fruits of understanding, fruits of love. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.